in Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost said, remember, this is verse 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Those words are thrilling, aren't they? I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the, the things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. Turn with me to uh, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Let me tell you a couple of things about the Hebrew language. First of all, it's three languages in one. It's the oldest language in the history of the world. It was the language that God used with his created beings, Adam and Eve. And apparently, according to the Bible, Hebrew was the, the, um, the only language that was spoken until things changed at the Tower of Babel. As I said, Hebrew is three languages in one. It's a phonetic language, which has to do with the sound that is made when Hebrew is spoken. It's also a numeric language, and it's uh, also a pictograph. Now, the pictograph means that each of the, the 22 symbols, what we would call letters of the alphabet, each of the 22 symbols paint a picture. God communicates with his, his people in pictures. And then each of those 22 character, uh, characters have a number designation. We miss out on a lot of things that the Bible provides for us that God spoke to us about primarily because we have limited knowledge of the Hebrew language. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I don't know Hebrew, but I can read a, um, a concordance. But even there, some of the meaning is lost. The depth of the, of the meaning of the Hebrew words is lost because of our lack of knowledge on what things mean and how God is communicating with his people. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The first word of the Bible is the word beginning. Now this word beginning, or the word that's translated from the Hebrew into the English as beginning, it's a six-letter word. Now in, in Hebrew, it's not unusual for there to be compound words. One word put together with another word to uh, provide the meaning that God's trying to communicate to us. But it's very rare for a, a, a Hebrew word to contain more than two different words that might make up a compound. This word beginning has five. There are five different words contained in the six letters that's translated in the beginning. Now, I'm not talking about jumbles. I'm not talking about rearranging letters or characters. I'm talking about just the, the six letters reading right to left as Hebrew does, the Hebrew language does. There are five different words. And each of those five words carries a separate meaning that's encapsulated or included in this word beginning. If you put all these things together, if you dissect the six letters of the word beginning to understand the true meaning, the fullness of the meaning that God has provided for us, the word beginning literally comes out like this. The Son of God, the creator of the universe, left his heavenly home to come to the earth to do something ordained by the hand and the power of God that will mark an event by the will of God beyond any other event known to mankind. You get that out of the first four letters. 
Now the remaining two letters identifies what this life-changing new beginning event is. It's an event where the Son of God, the Son of the Creator of the earth, is crushed and destroyed and also destroys through his being crushed. And the sign of that earth-shattering event is a cross. Now, as I said, part of the Hebrew language or one aspect of the Hebrew language has to do with the numbers assigned to it. Now, there are certain things that we have to presuppose and accept as a, a foundation for things to make sense to us. One of those things is, well, let me back up a little bit. There are two different words of God that are given to the Jewish people. The first is the Torah, and that's the written, uh, the written word that Moses had delivered to him on Mount Sinai. You remember Moses was up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights and it talks about the, the storm and the thunderings and the lightnings and all the things that were taking place that they could see from the bottom of the hill, bottom of the mountain. And they concluded that nobody could live through that. It was so awesome. It was so awe-inspiring that the people of Israel, after they had been delivered from bondage, the bondage of Pharaoh, through mighty signs and wonders. Nothing ever like that had been seen before in the history of the world. And they concluded, just by the sheer terror that took place, the quakings and the thunderings and the lightnings and whatever else was involved, they concluded that nobody could live through that. But if Moses was up in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, the only thing that he came down the mountain with was the two stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. Now there's some speculation on who wrote the Ten Commandments, whether God etched it in stone or whether Moses chiseled it out. But even if Moses chiseled it out, how come it takes 40 days and 40 nights to come down with those two stone tablets? The point is, there were a lot of other things that God communicated to Moses other than just these 10 commandments. Now the Torah is the written word and it was certainly added to by other prophets to make up what we know of as the Old Testament, what the Jews recognize or understand is the Torah. But then there's also an oral tradition. In other words, things that God spoke to Moses about in the mountain that didn't make it to the written word. Now, if God is the author of these things, if it was God speaking, which obviously it was, then what he said that wasn't written down is, is as important as what was written down. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Well, in the Talmud, which is the oral tradition, it is said that God communicated to Moses about all things even concerning the end of the age. This earth-shattering event that is included or contained in the word beginning, for the Jew, is accepted by what God revealed to Moses in this Talmud, the oral tradition. Now, since it's not written down 
as the Torah would be, I think we would have to conclude or work from the assumption that anything that's claimed to be said by God to Moses and then passed down to the, uh, the ancient rabbis would have to be measured and judged against other scripture. Anybody can claim that God said something. And those things should be examined and judged according to other scriptures. Well, one of the things that is claimed in the Talmud is that God revealed to Moses that his creative work, the six days of creation and then the seventh day of rest, is a prophetic pattern. that is repeated over and over and over again. And the reason that it's repeated over and over again hundreds of thousands of times through the years is so that man would recognize that God's plan would be for man to be on the earth for six of those 7,000 years and then there's a day of rest or a, a, millennial, a millennial period, thousand year period, where Jesus comes back and establishes his rule upon the earth and rules the earth with a rod of iron. The ancient Jews recognized that God's work with mankind would be for 6,000 years. And then there would be a 7,000th seven year of rest well these last two letters that identify that it's the crucifixion that is the life changing event the new beginning if you will was defined in this word in this word that's translated beginning to be 4,000 years on God's time clock. Now I want you to look with me to Hosea chapter 6. Verse 1. It says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. Peter is the only one that recognizes or is the only one that uh, records this ancient Jewish belief, foundation of belief, of 6,000 years for man to be here on the earth. And after that, the millennial reign of Jesus. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, I believe it is, Peter says, talking about end time events, he said, know this one thing, that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Well, this speaks to the, the ancient rabbi's claim that man will be here for 6,000 years and after that, the millennial reign of Jesus, it identifies more than just the ancient rabbi's belief, but the fact that the Holy Ghost inspired Peter to, to put it in a writing or a letter that he sent to believers identifies that it was the belief of the early church fathers and not just the Old Testament. If we accept that as a pattern, then here in Hosea chapter 6 is telling us virtually the same thing that the beginning word includes. And that is from the time of the crucifixion 
Man is to have 2,000 years on this earth before Jesus comes back. Now, as I said, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. And you notice that I haven't tried to tackle any of the pronunciation of these words or these other characters and symbols. I'd make such a mess of that that I'd lose the service completely, I'm sure. But folks, it's important for us to recognize the signs that we're living under, the times and the seasons that we're experiencing. Could it be that Hosea is prophesying about the end times? One thing is for sure, he connects it to what we know of as the early and the latter rain. I'll draw your attention to James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. I'll remind you that Hosea said that he'll come to us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. I'll draw your attention also to other scriptures that we've talked about in these end times events. Zechariah 10.1, ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. Could this be what God is saying to Isaiah? Let me read verses 9 and 10 again in Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now folks, why do we not know when the rapture is taking place? Jesus himself said that no man knows the day or the hour. Paul wrote to the church and said, though, that we should understand the times and the seasons. In other words, whereas we may not know the day or the hour, there's nothing that precludes us from knowing the year or the season when the Lord will return. And if God was trying to keep things concealed from us, then why did he give us a pattern? And why did he give Moses information that the uh, seven-day week that repeats over and over and over again is a type of the end when Jesus comes back for the church? Seems to me that if he wanted to conceal things and keep these things hidden and to keep us from looking, searching, the scripture to identify what time we do live in seems like it had been a whole lot easier for him if he just hadn't said anything about it at all. But folks, God's not the concealer. He's the revealer. He's the revealer. Now, the only reason we don't know for certain what year Jesus is coming back is because we don't know when to start counting. And all the mistakes that have been made by different groups, different churches, different ministers, and so forth, it all comes down to one thing. You don't know where to start counting from. As a result, many of people's predictions have shown that what they claim to have received from God, the information they received from God, wasn't really from God. And I wouldn't be so foolish as to say that I've got all the answers or to try to put some kind of definitive point on God's timetable as the the absolute irrefutable proof of God's future plans for the church. But could it be that when
when Isaiah talked about the greatness of God, the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe, is it possible that God is saying in this beginning, this word beginning, the very first word of the scripture, were clues for us to recognize so that we would know the times and the seasons that we're living. I believe that very specifically, folks. There are other prophecies that were fulfilled. Other things where God enabled the children of Israel to know exactly when something would take place. One of the prophecies of Daniel was that from the year that the rebuilding of Jerusalem took place plus the 69 weeks each week corresponding to a year when you add that 483 years to the time when Artaxerxes commissioned Ezra to begin the rebuilding of Jerusalem it turned out to be exactly the time that was prophesied. The prophecy was from the, the beginning of the rebuilding of Jerusalem plus those 483 years came out to be the year that Jesus began in ministry. And the prophecy was that at that certain time after the mathematical calculations were made that would be the time when Messiah would come. So it all comes down to where do we be begin to count? I talked about some of these things last week and I, I really don't want to focus on that so much. And part of the reason is because it scares young people. And I remember growing up in the Baptist church when I was a kid they talk about the rapture a lot. And I didn't want to be raptured. I'm not saying I wanted to miss the first load. <laughs> I'm saying that I didn't want Jesus to come back that quick. There were things I wanted to experience in life. And so I know it sometimes shakes young people up when we talk about the notion that Jesus could come any time. And folks, I've got to tell you, there's nothing left prophetically that has to occur, that has to take place before Jesus comes. The only thing we're waiting for is the shout. We are that close. Turn with me to John chapter 14, please. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And whither I go you know, and the way you know. Now one of the things that was taught to us in the Baptist church that I was a part of. And these are, I don't mean to be critical. People only know what they know. And there's certainly been a lot more truth and revelation that has come, uh, come about and been accepted just in my lifetime that had things been different when I was a child maybe the teaching would have been different too. But they told us that Jesus was building houses in heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. They told us that Jesus was, in, was building mansions in heaven and that when he finished, did he come back and get to church? Now folks, remember Jesus created the universe in six days.
Why would it be taking him so long to build the houses? Is he running short on supplies or something? The place he's talking about is a place with God. He's talking about a place with the Father. He's talking about salvation and the opportunity to be in Christ. But that opportunity for the disciples and for others, including us who believe on Jesus through their words, that opportunity couldn't, couldn't come or couldn't be realized until Jesus had suffered and shed his sinless blood. So the place he's talking about is he's talking about a place of righteousness, a place in God's family. I want to point you to something else that was here that we may have skipped over briefly. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, this word if is the word since. There are four different words in the, English, in the Greek language that are used and translated into the word if. One of them, and the most, uh, the most common words that's translated if, is the word since. And if, or since I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Notice he's talking about where he is, not where he's going. That where I am, you may be also. He's talking about a place in him. He's talking about a place provided for, provided for us by salvation. He's talking about a place of righteousness. He's talking about a relationship with God. He's not talking about a house to live in. He's talking about a relationship. So he says, if I go... I'll come again that you may be where I am. In other words, just as much a child of God as he is. God being your heavenly father just as much as he was Jesus' heavenly father. And if, since I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, the place of relationship, there may you be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we, not know where, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will suffice us. And Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the world, that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I'm going to draw your attention to another verse of Scripture in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus is in Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. And at Caesarea Philippi, there is a place. The ruins are still there today. And you can go see what it was like. But apparently, that was a, um, a strip mall for idolatry. There was portico after portico after portico of places where you could offer burnt offerings to different idols. Kind of a one-stop shopping type of experience. 
And at that place, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? In the midst of people, great crowds of people worshiping and offering sacrifices to different gods, different idols, Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that you're John the Baptist and some Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus said unto them, But whom say you that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock, he's talking about it in Peter, the rock is the truth, the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should not tell any man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now notice verse 21. This is what I was trying to get to. From that time forth, in other words, beginning from this point and continuing until Jesus went to the cross, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now, folks, we know that John wrote his gospel much later than any of the others. And John wrote his gospel. It seems to me that he's filling in a lot of blanks. And there's nothing that he provides, no place, uh, other place of information that he provides about the Holy Ghost that any of the other writers express. John wrote this, his gospel, in somewhere around 90 to 95 A.D., which was a good 30 years later than any of the other letters written to the church. And it is almost as if the Holy Ghost impressed upon John in these latter years of his life to tell us and provide for us additional truth or additional information that we couldn't get from the other gospel writers. Now with that in mind, with in mind the fact that Jesus began to clearly and plainly teach the disciples about the crucifixion and about the resurrection, when he gets to this last supper, this last Passover meal that he experienced with his disciples, he begins to tell them about going to prepare a place. He begins to tell them about coming back again to them. And they're acting like they'd never heard any such thing. So they certainly didn't take to heart what Jesus was plainly teaching them beginning in Matthew chapter 16. The Bible even tells us that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples and upbraided some of them because of their hardness of heart and their unbelief. Now, I can certainly accept that when Jesus began to tell them these things, these things being the truth of the resurrection, or the crucifixion and the resurrection, I can understand that they would be sorrowful. I can understand that they would have questions because it was certainly nothing like anything that they'd ever heard before. And so giving them the benefit of the doubt, I can recognize that there were difficulties that they would have with the things that he was saying. But according to what John tells us in John chapter 14, Jesus expects them to know and have believed what he told them. And he would certainly have a right to that. So when he starts talking about providing a place for them, the only thing they hear is that he's going away. 
there seems to be no understanding whatsoever from these disciples after three and a half years of ministry with Jesus on the earth. There seems to be no recognition of acceptance of the truth that he taught them about the crucifixion and then being raised from the dead three days later. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now notice verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while in the world see me no more, but you see me because I live, and you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loves me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Notice verse 18 again. I will not leave you comfortless. When Jesus talks about this, he's responding to what they have shown that they didn't believe about what he explained to them concerning his death, burial, and resurrection. The only thing they're concerned about is that Jesus said he was leaving. If you look at when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he asked his disciples to pray, they fell asleep but the scripture says that they fell asleep because of sorrow. So the only thing that they seem to have gotten from this was the realization that Jesus is saying that he's going to be departing. They didn't ask, is this where you're talking about being raised from the dead after three days? I would have to believe that if we were in the same situation as the apostles, maybe we'd have trouble believing to the fullest just like they did. But there would have to be some kind of recognition that these words were tying into stuff that he'd told them before. Why would they completely discount what he was explaining to them? We didn't read far enough to go to identify it, but it just passed where Jesus was beginning to tell them clearly about his death, burial, and resurrection. It tells us later that Peter came to him and rebuked him for these things. He said, no, it's not going to be like that, Lord. And Jesus turns around and rebukes the devil who Peter was apparently listening to when he formulated his opinion of what Jesus said. Jesus told a parable about an unjust judge and the purpose for the parable is to encourage us to never stop praying or never stop believing for what the Bible says is ours. The unjust judge wouldn't take the part of this woman that came to him day after day after day. It says specifically that he didn't respect God or fear God or fear any other man. He seems to be just out there doing things on his own. And she kept coming, asking him to avenge her. And he wouldn't do anything about it to begin with, but then finally says, she's pestering me so much, it's worth helping her just to get rid of her. And so he does. He takes her side and avenges her, whatever the, the circumstances would have been. And then Jesus said, hear what the unjust judge says, says. The unjust judge, out of convenience for himself, took her side. But then he asked something that seems to be completely unrelated. He said, how be it when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? In other words, is he going to find people that are holding on 
like she did? Or is he going to find people that have given up on the promises of God because of how long it's been? Paul was inspired to write to Timothy and to the church and tell us what the hearts of men would be like in the, in the last days. Jesus talked about, and Paul did as well, talked about how in the last days people will turn away from the faith What would cause somebody to turn away from the faith? I don't believe that that means that people, Christians will stand up and say, I hate God. I was wrong in believing what I did in times past. But it's very easy for me to see how that people get caught up in things that are taking place in the world secular things, things that don't seem to be spiritual and lose their place not necessarily in relationship with God but they lose their place with spiritual growth and maturity. One of the things that is, has caught my attention in the things that are taking place in these last days things that have taken place just in the last year. I used to think that it was possible for there to be a, a lag time, a certain period of time, not a long period, but some time between the rapture and the tribulation. It was presented to us, and I grew up with this idea, and you know, when you're a kid, you don't necessarily judge things. You don't have the wisdom or the maturity to judge things like you should when you're older. And so I always thought that if the rapture took place on Friday, then the tribulation begins on Saturday. And it very well may be that way. But there's nothing in the scripture that identifies it specifically one way or the other. And one of the things that caused me to, to be inclined toward this or recognize the possibility of this is the fact that there were things that weren't necessarily lining up with an immediate tribulation theory or idea. But this year has changed all that in my, in my opinion. There are things that are taking place. Remember Jesus said, keep your eye on Israel and the other nations to know when the end would come. There are things that are taking place in the Middle East that have undone, absolutely, completely undone some of the gains made in the previous administration concerning Middle East peace deals and and treaties and agreements and so forth. Remember the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war against Israel starts the first day of tribulation period. It is the first 24 hours of that seven year period of tribulation. Well, we know that it's Russia and the coalition army, mostly Muslim nations in Europe and in Africa that make up that coalition And it seems that things are progressing now with th things that have been done and undone so that it's very possible that Russia is on the edge along with Iran and many of these other Muslim nations to wage war instantly. I used to think that maybe it would be necessary for the church to be gone 
from the earth for a, a period of time, maybe a year, maybe two years, so that these things could realign themselves with the way that the Bible says that it'll be. But folks, the further and further we go into unchecked ungodliness, unrighteousness, it could be that they could pull the trigger instantly. We've never seen a display of evil and a refusal to even identify the facts of any given situation. But it's, instead, it just seems to be unchecked evil. Satan has certainly got a free reign and a free course to do just about anything he wants to do at this point. And I don't say this for political purposes. I've said from the beginning, I don't believe politics is the answer for America. But every day and every week that goes by, it proves that more and more. When God speaks to his people through the prophets, he speaks to identify and reveal to us the power of the Holy Ghost that will be seen and known upon the earth, all the earth. He will come to us as the rain. He will come to us as the rain, the early and the latter rain. That early and that latter rain, that move of the Holy Ghost is the necessary agent and is the only agent that will bring about this precious fruit of the earth that Jesus is waiting for. I'm not looking for miracles to take place in the political realm. I'm looking for miracles to take place that will bring people into God's kingdom. I couldn't care less what happens politically anymore. I think we were right in putting our emphasis on doing what we could at the time that it was available to us. But we live in a different day than we did just several months ago. And look how things have changed. How in the world could we ignore the reality of the, evil, of the end times that we live in? You've got to have your head buried pretty deep in the sand not to recognize the reality of what's going on around us. Jesus talked about signs of the end. Wars and rumors of wars. Pestilence, famine, plagues. Earthquakes. Racial conflict. Nations rising up against nations. Governments, countries rising up against other countries. But one of the most important things that he said was that this gospel shall be preached in all the world for a witness and with power. And then shall the end come. Jesus is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and the only thing that's going to bring that about is the power and the display of God's power. The presence of God and the display of his power. He said that the glory of the latter day church would be greater than of the former. We're talking about a period of time. Short that it may be. 
But the Bible speaks of a period of time where miracles will be commonplace, where healings will be abundant, where salvation shall be many, and many people's hearts will be turned toward the Lord. The Bible talks about when Paul and Silas were in prison for having preached the gospel. At midnight they prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a mighty earthquake. Suddenly there was a mighty earthquake. I'm looking for some suddenlies in these last days, folks. I'm looking for sudden healings. I'm looking for sudden miracles. I'm looking for sudden salvations I believe God's still in the suddenly business what's our part well we read in Zechariah 10 1 to ask if the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign I don't think that means just casually ask God so we could have a miracle or two to satisfy our curiosity One of the things that has arrested me of late, many of you know that I've been dealing with what's called Parkinson's disease and some of the symptoms surrounding it. And folks, I've got to be honest with you. I think the medical community could best be described as not having a clue what it is. Because nearly every symptom that you could imagine can in some way be related to Parkinson's. So for me, it's been over a period of a long time, it's as if there have been a hundred different sicknesses or diseases that have cropped up just based on symptoms. The word has been strong enough and great enough to deal with every one of the symptoms. There are only a couple left and one's visible and one's not. But just last week, I didn't realize until things changed that it had affected my sleeping so much it's been a long time since I've been able to lay down and sleep for more than like four hours at a time but last week I woke up and had had a dream I didn't realize until things changed how long it had been since I did dream I'm aware that deep sleep or what they call REM sleep is when your body begins to amend there's something about deep sleep that enables your body to fight off sicknesses and diseases and other such but I woke up one morning after having have, after having a dream having had a dream I'll get it out here in a minute and instantly Joel 2 came to mind and in those days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams well I had to straighten the Lord out on what old man means <laughs> but I'm dreaming again that may not seem like much to you and if you'd asked me I wouldn't have recognized it 
it might not have meant so much to me, but boy, it sure does now. See, the concept of believing and continuing to believe or praying and continuing to pray, that hits real close to home for me. There have been things that the Lord has told me along the way and the victories that I've experienced. Maybe I haven't done a good enough job of relating them. But to be perfectly honest with you folks, I really don't like talking about myself unless I absolutely have to. And so maybe I haven't done as good a job as keeping people informed. And the results of standing in faith on the word. But folks, I have seen I have seen the glory of God in visions as to what would take place. The Lord has been so faithful to show me enough to keep me going. And as I've said before, beating back these symptoms one by one by standing on God's word, confessing and believing his word has been the greatest honor of my life. But I have seen the end. I have seen the end of the things that I'm dealing with. I've seen things vanish in the visions and the dreams again. I've seen the things that can't be seen the symptoms that nobody else knows about, I've seen them arrested. I've seen them conquered. And I have seen in this vision what the Bible describes as joy unspeakable and full of glory. I had a vision a little over a year ago of the end of all of these things that I've been dealing with. And in an instant, the joy that I experienced at having once and for all dealt with, stood against and conquered. And it's a, it brought a joy that I've never experienced before. And just that one second or maybe less experience that I had with the joy of the Lord, that's kept me going for over a year. I believe the church is in store for a lot of those things. I don't believe it was just for me. I don't doubt that he did it just for me. But folks, there's a joy that's set ahead for us when the glory of the Lord is revealed in its greatest measure. I don't mean to discount what's happening now because God's still doing some great things. But there's a place that's coming for us that will enable us a joy that is provided for us that will set aside every earthly desire every physical thing that this world offers will pale in comparison to the joy of the Lord One of the things that the Lord impressed upon me when I was having trouble sleeping, one night I was telling the Lord 
certain things and praying certain things about my family, my kids particularly. That the Lord impressed upon me that my job was changing a little bit to include being a night watchman. I don't mean I'm going out to get a job as a night watchman. <laughs> but rather to use the time to keep watching, to keep praying. I can't tell you how convinced I am that we're going to experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. I expect it to fully change our lives where we run to church if for no other reason than people of like faith that we can share what the Lord has done for us over the last days or weeks or whatever. joy unspeakable and full of glory that's in our future don't worry about the finances God will see to that as Paul said and others be it unto me even as you have spoken I've been saying, be it unto me even as you've shown me. Folks, God's word works. There may be differences in the way that it works than what you and I might think or hope or expect, but God's word never fails. No matter what it looks like or how long it's looked like it. God's word never fails. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Father, I thank you that you have established an everlasting covenant and that according to your word, you will never stop following after us to do us good. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice that you would give a heart, a reverential fear of the Lord to them that they might never turn away from you. I thank you, Father, for rejoicing over us in doing us good. We say as the children of Abraham, that we will not fear for you are our shield and our great reward Father I pray for every person that belongs to this church that has joined themselves to us I pray that you would give each and every one of us an encounter with you Paul had an encounter with you, Father, on the road to Damascus. Give each one of us an encounter with you, Lord. Through your goodness and by your mercy, I pray that it would be so. Father, thank you for our new beginnings. Your word says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. Father, we know that in truth. But I pray you would bring it about for each and every one of us in experience. That we would each 
of us would experience the greatness of your love, the completeness of your mercy, and the joy of the Lord. I pray these things in the precious and matchless name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Folks, Jesus is coming soon. And he's coming for a glorious church. Amen. Let's all stand. As was announced earlier, we're going to have a baptism, which is just right outside these rear doors of the sanctuary.